Uh, first of all, uh, to my far right, uh, Professor Sanjay Sarma, uh, who is actually here at uh, MIT, uh, Professor of Mechanical Engineering and one of the founders of the Auto ID Center here uh, at MIT. Uh, Co-chaired uh, the Auto ID Research Council, which consists of six labs worldwide, which you uh, helped to organize. And today, the suite of standards developed by the, by the Auto ID Center, commonly referred to as the EPC, are, buying, are used by over 1,000 companies. Uh, you have a bachelor's from uh, IIT, master's from Carnegie Mellon, and PhD from UC Berkeley. Uh, Mark Roberti, uh, to his left, is the editor of the RFID channel, uh, journal uh, and has been reporting on business for major publications since 1985. His work has uh, appeared in these small publications such as the New York Times, Fortune, the Wall Street Journal, and a few other pu publications. Uh, launched the RFID uh, journal on the web in 2002, and it's the most widely read <laughs> this is a difficult thing to say, widely read website on RFID in the world, uh, and widely regarded as a thought leader in RFID. Bob LaFort, one of two Bobs uh, on the panel today, is the CEO of Ember. Uh, Ember Corporation develops wireless mesh networking technology uh, for smart energy connected homes and many other monitoring and control, control applications. Uh, previously was uh, the president of Infineon Technologies North America and holds an MBA from Boston uh, University and a BES EE from uh, University of Mass at Lowell. Finally, uh, to my right, uh, Bob Metcalf, um, who I'm sure no one has heard of here, is a general partner at Polaris. Uh, during his uh, brief and undistinguished career, um, <laughs> Uh, earned a bachelor's from MIT here, uh, a master's from Harvard, um, uh, co-invented the Ethernet, uh, was a Stanford professor, co-founded 3Com, now HP, was a Cambridge fellow, received the National Medal of Technology, IEEE Medal of Honor, and has actually been inducted into the National Inventors Hall of Fame in Akron. Akron? Maybe it was Akron. Akron is very good. Uh, so uh, it's, it's our great pleasure to have this distinguished panel uh, with us today. So why don't we get into to just a little bit of conversation here. Why don't we start with Sanjay Sharma. Um, you've been at this Internet of Things uh, um, gig for a while. Um, in our research, we think of the Internet of Things as being um, sensors and actuators embedded in physical objects connected through networks, often wireless uh, to computing uh, resources. Uh, but you've been at it since, you know, way back in um, the late 90s, for instance. Um, so we'd love to hear a little bit about you know, the history and then what were you thinking at that time? What was the vision for, for these, this sort of technology? Sure. Uh, we started in uh, 1998 and um, our vision actually was not very different from uh, what the Internet of Things is today. And in fact, many people preceded us with that vision uh, uh, around the world. It's uh, nothing new. You know, turn your lights off from your cell phone. Now, the thing, though, is that in 1998, uh, I'd been using you know, the internet for 10, 15 years, but uh, it wasn't widely regarded as a consumer technology. So we set our, uh, our, um, our priorities and our ambitions a little lower, and we said, why don't we just try and put, you know, replace barcodes and things with, uh, with wireless uh, identification uh, nodes, and of course that's RFID. And we started looking at RFID, and RFID tags were like two, three dollars. And we said, mm, that's not going to happen. You know, when the barcodes took off in uh, the 70s, it was a few cents. So we really need to bring RFID tags down to a few cents. And uh, that was our ambition. And um, through a combination of um, recklessness um, and disregard for uh, history and uh, for the future, <laughs> frankly, we said, you know, we think we can make it five cents. And uh, over the course of 10 years, uh, we've done a lot of research on this. Uh, you know, we, uh, about 100 sponsors joined us, Walmart, Best Buy, you know, Philips, uh, basically the entire uh, uh, retail industry, consumer products industry. And uh, we were able to bring the cost of tags down. And basically what we did, and this is where the Internet of Things concept emerged from, was that we said, look, we will put simply a number on the tags. We actually will not put data on the tags. And people went, what do you mean? And that's how we made the tags cheap, right? By not putting data on the tags. And people would go, but where do you put the data? And we'd say, we'll put it on the internet. And, uh, and people would point us and say, what internet? And I'd stick, hold my cell phone up and say, trust me, you know, every cell phone will carry the internet you know, at one point in time, right? And 
That was our big controversial statement. Kevin Ashton was one of the founders of the Auto ID Center. Uh, one day in desperation said, it's the, not the internet of people, it's the internet of things. And uh, that's how the word took off. Um, the, uh, over the last 10 years, what we've learned is that, in fact, connecting inanimate objects to the network is the least of the challenges, the technology is there. The challenge is, in fact, getting people to deal with systems where objects are automatically connected to the networks. And I'll leave it with this final thought, which is business process change, getting people to operate in this new world is a far greater challenge than anything technological. The Internet of Things is here, it's been here, it is the future. You might not do it, your kids will live on it. It might be too late for you folks. <laughs> And with that happy thought, what, could, could you give us an EG? I mean, what's that vision? What, what is it that you can do? What, you know, what is, what's a business process you could transform by having? Um, For example, let's say that you wanted to take this building and make it, uh, you know, redo the HVAC systems. In fact, we had a PhD committee uh, meeting recently and a student graduated, Bob, uh, attended that meeting. And redo the HVAC systems, you know. Uh, do all the diagnostics remotely. Well, the problem is there's a lot of job security issues, the building maintenance staff, the construction staff, you know, they can't really deal with it, right? So there's gonna be a lot of resistance. But in fact, if you did that, the impact on sustainability is huge, right? Yeah. But I assure you, that's a hard pill to swallow for the existing infrastructure of people who live in a certain way, right? Who, whose jobs live in a certain knowledge bank that is going to be replaced. And I think that's where people like Ember and, you know, and others come in. Interesting, that, 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 that it's actually the people that get most affected by the Internet of Things. Yeah. Mark, you've been looking at this field for quite some time as well as, as an observer and a, a documenter through RFID Journal. What, what, what have you seen uh, you know, over the past 10 years as, or, or more as this has evolved? Um, quite a lot, actually. Um, when I first uh, went up to, to MIT and heard about the Auto ID Center, um, it was 2000. They, they had been doing their work for about two years. Um, and I had heard about RFID accidentally. Um, I was writing about, uh, about uh, IT, and uh, I was covering supply chain technologies, uh, Manugistics and I2 and those guys, and I used to interview people and I would say to them, um, did you get the benefits that you thought you would get? You just spent $2 million on software. Did you get the benefits? And every single person, without exception, said the same thing, no. So the next what obvious question. What? Uh, well, I too, I think, was bought, and I'm not sure about many. Anyway, um, they always said no, and so I would. Next obvious question is why not? Does the software not work? Does it? And they said no. The software basically does what it's supposed to do, but you put bad data in, and you get bad forecasts out. And so I started asking questions. Well, what do you mean bad data? So they would say, well, you've got two pallets. They're they're completely different. Uh, one's Diet Coke, one's Coke. The guy, the operator, says beep beep. Now in my inventory, I have two Diet Cokes and no Coke. Okay, so now you kick out a forecast and it's completely wrong, okay? So I started looking for uh, how do you solve this problem of getting good data into your systems. And um, I went to a conference that was actually, it was about managing uh, factories over the internet. And I, I just happened to sit down next to this guy and I was talking to him about this other story I was working on. And uh, he said, oh, you should look into RFID. And I asked him what it was, and he explained. And he got me intrigued because he said, oh, the DOD is actually using this on, on battleships to, to track all the Cheerios and everything. And I'm like, oh, this is a great story, right? I, I'm, gonna, I'm jumping on this one. And of course, it turned out to be true. They weren't quite that far down the road. Um, but they were interested in doing that stuff. And so I interviewed 60 people for the story, which was the entire RFID industry at that time. I mean, literally, I, I spoke to everybody. Um, you know, there was NXP, then Cole Phillips, there was TI, there was a bunch of people. Somebody mentioned the Auto ID Center, and I went up and I met, I met Kevin, and uh, he told me this story of we're going to connect stuff to the internet, and I'm like, I'm totally blown away. So I come back, and every, every cocktail party I go to, I'm talking about this, you know, we're going to connect stuff to the internet, it's going to be great. People are like, Mark, shut up, all right? Go, go away with that stuff. And so um, I was actually working for the industry standard, which was the, the Bible for the dot-com era, and um, uh, it exploded in uh, August of 2000. I was laid off, and 
I said, well, if this is really the next big thing, if this really is going to replace barcodes one day and uh, people are going to need information, I'm an information guy. So I bought a book. I learned how to write HTML. I, got, I, I started the company with uh, the book cost me f uh, uh, 50 bucks. The HTML software cost me 500 and I had a 995 a month internet uh, uh, plan. So I wrote the code, I put up stories, and immediately people started coming. And, you know, so basically I said, you know, I told my wife in the beginning I'll spend an hour a week on this. And I wound up spending, of course, a lot longer than that. But uh, it's been an explosion. So, so, so I think the idea of a five cent tag generated a lot of interest, a lot of excitement about RFID, um, a lot of skepticism as well, of course. And, uh, but, but now we've seen tremendous innovation going on. I mean, the stuff, you know, in, the, in, in those days you had HF tags, you had, you know, two standards, uh, the, the tags were three bucks, there was nothing happening. I mean, basically, you know, companies here or there might use it for a very specialized application, but uh, it was mainly cattle tagging, uh, access control for the doors, and uh, automobile immobilizers, and that was the entire market. There was no, very little supply chain tracking, very little anything else. What's the most uh, impactful application that, that, that comes to mind right now as you think about how we've come, where we've come from and where we are now? Well, um, it's difficult to say. I mean, the, the main application folks are looking at is asset tracking. So whether it's uh, hospital equipment or reusable containers or whatever, uh, folks are interested in, in, in getting a hold of those assets. Uh, that's sort of the, the low-hanging fruit. It's, it's a basic application. You can get an ROI real quick. Um, but I think it, it, it's, um, the problem with it is folks are sort of saying, okay, well, let's solve this problem with RFID, and then later on they're going to go, well, we got this problem over right here. This, that system won't work over here. Now we need a different system. Um, so, you know, we sort of advocate having a holistic approach to, to you know, deploying this as infrastructure, as a, an extension of your ERP system uh, so that you can manage all of your mobile assets um, and, and, and more, you know. Uh, so there's, there's the, the applications are exploding. I mean, I, you know, we, we see every industry, um, things that you would never imagine, like uh, acid reflux or uh, tracking babies who might have SIDS, or pre you know, preventing SIDS. I mean, there's, there's just an enormous explosion in innovation going on. Speaking of innovation, uh, Bob LaFort, uh, you, you're actually building a company based on this concept. Can you tell us a little bit about your, what you're doing at the company and then you know, where you see, see things headed? Yeah, at, uh, at Ember, what we do is the chips and software to basically enable the vision that we've been talking about. And uh, I think there are a lot of applications and we've seen them. Uh, when you ask about deployments, it depends a little bit about your definition of deployment. If it's, are there products out there that work and people get value, there's probably been that around for 10 years. But if it's something that's sustainable that you can do the next round of innovation and investment to, to make a business and, and continue it going, uh, it's taken a while for us to see that type of traction, that type of volume. Uh, and there's a variety of reasons for that. But what we see right now is the idea of, of uh, clean tech. And, and really, the, the part of clean tech we play in is the idea of efficiency. And uh, as, as we discussed a little, and as a, um, a person that I was talking to from Shell once said, it's unbelievable the power of convenience. We don't really think about it as a business model, but habits and convenience are important. So what's happened now with this idea of smart energy is you're going to have to have the utility talk to the home individually. You're going to have to have the, uh, the home then be able to do things automatically and very conveniently to do some things that, in particular, the idea of demand response, where 1% of the time you use 15% of your energy. And if you could just be smarter about that and do it in a way that is seamless and easy, then all of a sudden you have a killer app. And that's really what we see. And it's the alignment of the people who are interested in saving money, the people who are interested in saving the planet, the business people like the utilities who are interested in operational efficiency, and of course the, um, uh, the overall regulators and politicians who see this as just pure net benefit. So now you're starting to get enough, uh, enough large application, large scale, large investment to be able to make this sustainable. So, so how does that work? How does the Internet of Things 
make sure that I'm using that piece of energy at the right time. Yeah, so what people don't want to have to have happen is that you're going to get an email and all of a sudden you have to run around your house and shut off your washer and dryer and then change your thermostat and then, oh, by the way, remember to do this. What they want to have happen is I can set a scenario and my scenario is my low cost scenario, my high comfort scenario, whatever I want to do, and then everything takes care of it myself and all I see is a net savings in my electric bill. And if you think of how you handle your electric bill, which for most people is probably the third or fourth largest bill they pay every month, it's archaic, right? What happens? Uh, two weeks after you've spent all of your money, you get a bill that you can only understand one number, which is the check you have to send to the utility. We wouldn't tolerate that when we buy a car, when we buy a house, when we buy groceries, but we tolerate that. And what's happening now is the utilities and the regulators are starting to come to an agreement that you need to be able to get real-time data and make adjustments and use your energy wiser. Yeah. Powerful. I mean, energy is a huge field. Uh, Bob Metcalf, you, you're now uh, an investor. And so, in fact, you know, in, in all, <laughs> for, for complete uh, transparency, an investor in, in Ember. <laughs> in fact, I think <laughs> Ember is on your tie, as it turns out. Um, where, where else are you seeing opportunity? Where are you seeing opportunity as an investor? What, what, what's the future for this? Well, uh, 10 years ago when the internet bubble burst, I, I had to make a model of the future, and, and I'm a plumber, so I looked at the kinds of traffic that would be coming, video, mobile, and embedded, and then incidentally the applications would be energy, healthcare, and education, the big ones. So embedded is what we're talking about today, a uh, different term, the internet of things, embedded networking. But even then, there were billions of microcontrollers being shipped every year. I think if I could just interrupt you, so yeah. why those three? So why, why energy, why education? You just look at the pr huge problems that the world has and, and uh, big application areas where the internet really hasn't had any impact in energy management and healthcare, which is completely screwed up. And then <laughs> education where they still use chalkboards, which is kind of funny. So those are the... Uh, Please tell uh, us how you really feel. <laughs> Well, is, isn't it obvious that energy and healthcare and education are the next big things to solve? So the internet will take care of those. So the, uh, <laughs> and you all are going to do it. So looking at embedded, so embedded traffic, that's the internet of things. Yeah, I think it's a space, and it's a huge space, and we don't quite understand the space, but there are two, actually on this stage, there are two halves of the space. These, those are the tag people over there. And, and we are the node people over here. And we're both in the embedded space, except they don't have any microcontrollers on their tags, and we cost a lot of money. So that, you know, we're several dollars, what do you, three, four, five dollars a node, and you're down to five cents a tag, but we're in the same space, we're on the same panel. So this space is sorting itself out, has been for t 10 years. We know where we stand. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's, you'll be numerous and cheap, and, and we'll be less so. Uh, Ember just shipped its 10 millionth uh, uh, Zigbee node into this, generally into the smart meter space. Hmm. 10 million, so 10 million is a big number. What's Zigbee? Zigbee is a uh, standard for uh, embedded networking. Uh, based on 802.15.4 CMOS radios, there's a protocol stack and development tools, a Zigbee standard, you can get it from Ember, you can get it from Texas Instruments, Freescale, Atmel. You think that's enough of your comp competition. <laughs> but it's a good standard when you have competitors all providing interoperable products. So Zigbee has achieved that status and now Ember and others have achieved scale there. Uh, but the point I wanted to make, a point I wanted to make is that even, I think there's like 10 to 15 billion uh, microcontrollers, not counting tags, just microcontrollers being shipped every year. Every year? Every year. That's a lot. Yeah. And most of them are not networked. So that's the Internet of Things opportunity is getting them tied together because as we know, there's a law that says that when you tie things together, <laughs> they get more valuable. <laughs> Well, I guess, Bob's law, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, going back to your question, so we're investors in four companies that might reasonably be called Internet of Things companies. One is Ember, which is profitable now, um, thank God. <laughs> uh, 
management feedback. And, in, and growing rapidly, so um, uh, thanks to Bob's efforts. We call him Le Bob. Uh, I, I am Zee Bob. And <laughs> we're also investors in Infinite Power Solutions, which is poorly named because it makes the world's smallest batteries. And why do you need tiny batteries? Because his nodes need power. And they're not going to be plugged into the wall because they're going to you know, cost almost nothing. There'll be lots of them. They'll be all over the wall. So you need batteries. And uh, Infinite Power makes these tiny rechargeable batteries appro appropriately for energy harvesting and uh, remote sensor and control networks. We're also uh, investors in Impinge, which is over there on the tag side. Impinge makes tags. Um, and I thought you, when you, uh, Mark, when you were asked the killer app, you were going to answer triathlons. <laughs> my family are all, not me, but my family are all triathletes. And I go, they used to, at triathlons, after the race, you'd have to give your tag back. You don't have to give your tag back anymore. Sure. So they bring, my kids bring home these tags, and they're all impinged tags, I might add. Uh, so there's the killer app, races. And they're, ironically, they're not tracking things. They're tracking people. So tags can be used also for tracking people, not just things. And then we're, invent, uh, we're more, most recently investors in a company called Sticky Bits that use, uh, they made the observation that a cell phone camera can take a picture of a barcode and then you can keep a lot. So the goal of this company is to turn everything into a website. So everything will have a website and then anyone who looks at and scans that same thing can add their commentary all organized around those barcodes and later RFIDs, they don't have to be barcodes. So those are the four companies in the Internet of Things space that we're investors in. Interesting. Mobile phones, of course, being one of the most widely deployed connected sensor devices that are out there. They have cameras, GPS, et cetera. So I'm curious about this distinction that you're drawing between the nodes guys with red ties <laughs> and the tags guys the with blue tags. shirts, no ties. Um, <laughs> but you got the note about the blue shirts. <laughs> you know, so many times when you have technologies with specific capabilities, that segmentation actually leads you to using those technologies for certain applications. So, Mark, maybe you could describe, you know, what are tags really good for? Okay, well, well let me back up um, and say that I think that the term the Internet of Things is, is a very valuable term in that it gives people a sense of, you know, the ability to connect these things. But it, it's sort of outlived its usefulness in a way because really what we're talking about is the ability to see, track, and manage the things we can't see, track, and manage today. So whatever, you, whatever it is, whether it's, whether it's uh, uh, assets on the grid or it's, 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 it's the environment that we live in, it's the people running across the, you know, we, we don't have good... Um, information about those things. And I would make the point that uh, GPS is part of this. So if, you, if you're tracking a ship, uh, you're going to use a GPS. You're not going to use RFID. You're not going to use one of Ember's tags. You're going to use a GPS. Um, it's not technically the internet, um, so, but it still gets you data into your, into your systems and you know, can be shared over the internet. And then on the other extreme, you know, you've got a pack of gum that costs five cents or 10 cents. Uh, it's going to be pretty hard to get that chip down. I don't think I'll see it in my lifetime that you're, you're going to put a, an RFID tag on that five cent thing. So you're going to use a barcode on that. Okay, and, and the barcode is useful because you can scan that and you can get data into your system. And if you're a CIO, you want to get the data into your system and you want to provide it to people so they can use it. So however you do that, um, RFID and, 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 and uh, related technologies are a way of doing it. And the great thing about RFID is, uh, is that it's automatic. So, so if you look at Ember's technology, no one has to do anything to adjust the temperature in the room if no one's there. Or if, there's a, if there is a, someone, someone mentioned an application to me, it, could you do flood control with RFID? So you could take Ember's technology, you could have a, 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 a water sensor or, or even a float sensor uh, that can sort of measure the amount of water coming up. You could sprinkle these things on the beach um, and it could be an early warning system so the nodes connect to each other. Um, so it really depends on what you want to do. All of these technologies enable you to, to manage the things that we really aren't managing today. 
Um, and so uh, you've, got, you've got barcodes, you've got very low cost uh, passive UHF tags, um, you've got UHF tags that have sensors uh, built into them, uh, then you've got an active RFID tag, um, there's also um, uh, ultrasound and, and, and uh, infrared technology, um, and you go up the chain, you, you know, Amber's technology's in there, and then sort of at the end you get, you get a GPS. And what you need to do if you're doing, if you're creating an enterprise system is, okay, what do I, what data do I want to collect on what things and what technology is appropriate for that? And, you know, the challenge we have in the RFID industry is this is not like barcodes. It's not just, hey, you stick the thing on, you scan it, boom, you're done. It's very complicated. There's a lot of different flavors of the technology. Um, it is, it is extremely powerful. And, um, you know, so, so it's sort of a challenge to get people to think about it. And that's why I was talking about an enterprise approach to this. You know, if you, if you look at your enterprise and you say, well, I wish we could track all these things that we don't track today, whether that's, you know, whether that's a laptop somebody's carrying around or a re returnable transport item or uh, a vehicle, whatever it is, a ship out on the ocean, I want to track all these things. What kind of an infrastructure do I need to do that? And RFID, in my view, uh, is a big chunk of that. Uh, but barcodes are not going away. GPS is certainly going to be important. You, you have to think about it in that, in that context. And it seems to me when you think about these enterprise applications, it's going to drive a tremendous deluge of data that will come from all of these tags, all of these nodes, et cetera. And you know, um, Sandra, you talked already about some of the human challenges but can you talk a little bit about, you know, as you've talked with CIOs and people who have to deal with del this deluge of data, you know, what is it that they need to do in order to, you know, to really put, put together? Well, yeah, I mean, look, the, uh, if you look at IT systems today, you know, take an SAP system, for example, right? SAP isn't used, I mean, it isn't really, uh, the, syst the system isn't used to, or it isn't prepared to handle feedback. Right? It gives, you know, if you're assembling a pallet, it tells you what to put in the pallet. But the pallet talks back to it. It simply doesn't have an ear to listen to it. You know, the pallet says, oh, you know, by the way, I'm leaving and instead of, you know, four cases of toothbrushes, I have six. There's no way for SAP to deal with that. But if you're in a company and you've, you know, installed an SAP, whatever, name, you pick your ERP system, right? And along comes RFID, which lets you see what actually happened in reality because the truck's you know, sending you a message saying, wrong pallet on the truck. The system isn't, you know, what do you do with this, right? You've already committed to this $300 million, some ridiculous number, you know, ERP contract to rejig your you know, entire IT system, and you have this new piece of information, so you ignore it, right? So, but if you ignore it, you've kind of missed the point, right? So this is the challenge. Now, what do you do with the data? You know, there's two things I'll, I'll say. The first thing is the most important thing to do with RFID data is to use it or lose it. Because it has, very, and the second thing is it, that it, real time information has very little shelf life. It rots, it loses its value very quickly. You know what I mean? I mean, if you catch the, you know, stitch in time saves nine, it's an expression we use, right? If you catch the truck before it leaves, you can fix the pallet. You can, you know, if you catch it a day later, it's too late. It's forensics, right? Well, but, but to some extent... It's, but it's still some, historical. It, well, yeah. you're updating your inventory, so the problem today right. with the two, the two pallets of Coke right. is that store, you know, right. their inventory is wrong. So right. at least now you could say, well, I, got, I, right. I can update that. I've got two, two pallets of Diet Coke arrived. Absolutely. So I mean, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but my point is that you've got to be able to A, accept feedback, which they can't, <laughs> right? Uh, I tell you, we were working with a store in, uh, you know, I also did a company which uh, fortunately we got acquired before the crash. Uh, but um, we... Uh, um, Why did you look at me when I was that? We uh, f discovered that the wrong trailer was delivered to the store. Not the wrong pallet, not the wrong case, not the wrong item, a whole can I say this? This is not cable. Damn trailer went to the wrong store. We discovered it. They don't know about it. They didn't want to know about it. <laughs> you know? This is a great segue to the question I was going to ask Bob Metcalf here. You know, you know, building on this, this previous comment, so there's the tremendous technical challenges along with this data being generated. But 
Um, you know, a lot of this audience is, is uh, our CIOs and leaders in the IT field. <coughs> and many times, um, you know, and certainly our client experience, um, you know, IT is often viewed as, you know, the people who make sure the desktops are up, the people who make sure Ethernet is connected. Um, but rarely <coughs> the kinds of people that you want crawling around on your trucks, you know, anywhere other than POS within a retail situation, uh, et cetera. Uh, you've been in a lot of companies. You know, what, what's the role of the IT function and the CIO in these sorts of applications? You know, it wasn't always true that IT people viewed their job as um, taking care of ethernets. There was a time when their job was to take care of mainframes and along came these PC things and ethernets and now you've taken it as a given that the IT people, that's their job. Well, the same things are recurring here which is that there's this new opportunity, not so new now, it's a um, new opportunity for getting greater uh, uh, control and greater reach in your IT systems. And so uh, it, in a few years you'll be saying, of course everyone understands it's an IT person's job to handle uh, the embedded, the internet of things and there'll be something new. So it's just a question of time. Uh, I would say there from our discussions that um, and you guys are the CIOs, but CIOs actually like the fact that this is converging on internet. They understand the internet. Their <coughs> bigger fear is having 18 distributed networks that they're not familiar with that are running there. You know, if you've got an HVAC system that's giving you control information on the internet, they know how to manage that data much better than if you have a whole separate one that's proprietary that they have no access to. So I think you do, I think this convergence is actually helping CIOs, not, it is complicated a little, but it's less complicated than the alternative. Do you sell to CIOs? We don't, but our customers do. And, uh, and we've seen that particularly at the utilities. And, and in fact, some of our customers have lost by that because they had a proprietary network and they were selling to their traditional customers and a competitor came in with a disruptive technology that was internet based and they sold to the CIOs and it was very effective. So yeah, we definitely see that as an impact to our business. Great. All right, well we're soon gonna have uh, time for all of you to, to ask those challenging and provocative questions and we'll try to come up with some challenging and provocative answers. Uh, but in order to segue in there, we're gonna to go to uh, Jim Cramer number two, the lightning round. Uh, and in, in this section, I will quickly ask a number of questions for which I'll ask each of the panelists to answer very quickly. So let me start with Sanjay and we'll move this through. So what will be the next new modality for wireless sensors beyond acceleration, temperature, sound, pressure, and light? Vehicles. We could have prevented the Toyota problem. Cars. I, I would say body, measuring the human body. Uh, uh, home security. They, they took the three I was. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, fitness. Fitness, very good. Uh, which Internet of Things application will be the basis of the next $1 billion business? Cars. <laughs> uh, just tracking mobile assets, mobile tools, whatever. Connected home. Energy management. Which country will this application be deployed in? I think uh, in, in a developing country where cell phones are leapfrogging. That's not a country. <laughs> well, one of the developing countries, say <laughs> India, China. I don't know, United States, I would say. Uh -huh. U.S. U.S. <laughs> Which is the bigger Internet of Things opportunity, B2B or B2C? B2C. 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 B2B. It's good I'm to catching be, on. It's good, be, it's good to be contrarian. Uh, what large incumbent company will compete best in Internet of Things? Doesn't exist yet. I would agree, none. I think service providers are going to take a lead. Yep. Service providers as in um, your ISPs and MSOs, which is hard to say that they're going to be a leader, but... Um, mm. Cisco. Oh. <laughs> what's, what's the biggest barrier to Internet of Things becoming a, a huge opportunity, or a huge business, not opportunity? People thinking outside the box or inability to do so. I agree, people. Uh, I, I, that's not a bad answer, but I would say uh, standards and complexity. Accepting those two, I would add the general notion of balance of system. That is, you can't just show up with a, a, a new technology. All the other pieces have to show up at the same time, including the, the ecosystem. Ecosystem. Interesting. 
What's the most critical talent issue for an Internet of Things I'm company? I'm sorry? What's the most critical talent issue for an Internet of Things company? A people thinking like Steve Jobs. You just need to think outside the box, you know, mm -hmm. just make it happen. Domain expertise. End-to-end -end user experience. <laughs> Can I go first next time? <laughs> <laughs> Ditto. <laughs> if Metcalf's law was about Internet of Things, what would it say? It would say exactly the same thing. That is, <laughs> you connect things together, they become more valuable. Anyone else want to challenge that? <laughs> I wouldn't. Don't. Don't. Well, you would change it to Bob's law. <laughs> La Bob's. Well, what's your biggest fear about Internet of Things? It's going to take a really long time, um, and, and I like things to happen faster. Uh, I think the consumer, the consumer adoption and, and use of it uh, intel intelligently. Um, I, I, I agree with Bob. It's going to take the fear is that it's going to take a long time. The, the other issue is, um, you know, sort of media distortion of it and privacy issues and, and so on. A new security paradigm. Uh, interesting. Please come to the, um, to, the, to the microphones and we'll be ready to take your questions one mo in one moment. And what excites you most about Internet of Things? The, uh, the good that it will do. Uh, that is the, uh, in all seriousness, I think energy is uh, the big challenge now. And the Internet of Things is required to solve energy because you, because you have to touch and change and sense and monitor things. So here it comes. I think the, the benefit to the individual. Right. Just the ability to, to do things much more efficiently than you can today. It's going to be a quantum leap in many areas. We are unsustainably inefficient. and We cannot survive if we stay that way. Great. Thank you. So it's time to open it up to uh, the audience. Let me remind everyone uh, that we're looking for questions rather than statements. And uh, shorter ones are better. So uh, why don't we start over here? Hello, hey, if you wouldn't mind in, uh, identifying yourself very quickly first. Sure. Hello, my name is uh, Guillermo Abadia. I work in, in the healthcare industry, but uh, in the past I worked in the you know, uh, process control for continuous and discrete industries. I'm very interested in this area. And last night I was looking into what kind of container would it be the appropriate container for RFID. And I really did not get a good answer. Uh, you know, it's very clear when you're controlling systems or when you are running algorithmic trading, or when you're doing healthcare, it's obvious what kind of container you would use to store the data. But with RFID, I'm not so clear yet. Could you elaborate on that? I'm not sure what you mean by con container. You mean a database? Is it a mean database? Is it, is it a time series database? Is no. it a relational yeah. database? Or is it some hybrid? What, no, it's a hybrid. I mean, in fact, I, the whole database concept is broken. It's meant for records. Uh, this is some sort of, uh, there's new database concepts like event, uh, oriented or streaming databases and so on, uh, RFID will basically have to go into some sort of a streaming action, uh, you know, automaton which acts. It's like you and me, you know, I see events, I react, and that kind of system doesn't really exist. Well, it does. Streaming databases are approaching it, but that's where I think it's going to end up. And don't you think, though, it's just going to be interrupt data, that 99% of it Absolutely. I'm going to ignore, but it's the 1% that I have to catch that makes all the difference? Right. I've always said that the most important thing to do with RFID data is throw it away, actually. And it's the exception that you're looking for. So you need that exception matching and reaction. Yeah. Over here. Hi, I'm Michael Davies. I'm a senior lecturer here. Hi, Bob. Um, this is a question mostly for the two Bobs. You said uh, Ember's now profitable, um, uh, but it was founded back in 2003, so it's taken eight years. What took so long and what can we... Why did it take so long and what can we learn from it? I think it's more than eight years. Yeah, it's yeah. like nine Thanks. years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it feels like 90 at times. Um, no, th I think it's, a, it's an excellent point. I think what you can take from it is that, uh, uh, number one, there was, there was a lot of hype that went well ahead of the reality. Number two is that you need people who think more like Steve Jobs than that think like, um, you know, large sustained utility uh, companies. And so, so you need people who are willing to, and that's been a long discussion because one of the good models of how this can go forward is the telecom industry. And as, as one person simplified the telecom industry experience, it was something where uh, we thought we were all getting 
cheaper telecom services. In some respect, we did, but most of you pay more for your telecommunications bill today than you did 10 years ago. Now, you pay it in many respects more happily because you're getting more services and more function. But in order to do that, look at the disruption that was caused in the industry. And in some of these other industries, that disruption has not been allowed to happen, whether it's in the automotive industry, whether it's in the process control industry, or whether it's in the utility industry. And that's going to be a challenge to big things happening fast. That's one. The second one is this whole idea of end-to-end -end communications or end-to-end -end solutions. If you look at what Apple did, right, they didn't invent the MP3 player. That's a very fragmented, small niche market right now. But they gave the consumer an end-to-end -end solution. And, and I'm not sure that there are those types of forward-thinking companies that are going to put it all together. So it's just going to take longer to get there. Uh, and that's what I think the lesson learned was, is that to make sure that, you can, that the hype is, is actually achievable and sustainable. But the good news is, is that um, we're getting a second, second chance to take a bite of the apple because a lot of the hard work that was done, it's, it's the old adage, you know, it took me 10 years to become an overnight success. I think that a lot of what was done was very useful and constructive to make sure that the right pieces are in place to go forward. So, uh, so I think we're in a, in a much different and a much better place now as the, um, the reality is starting to catch up to the hype. But there's a lot of tough reasons why it took a long time. Hope springs eternal. We should not have been surprised that it took nine years to get to this point that in the Zigbee space. We should not have been surprised because there have been so many precedent cases, and it has to do with the adoption of the making of the new standards, figuring out in this huge undefined space, how many standards do you need to span it, and you know which is the most promising one, so we're going to do Zigbee over here. And we did not know that uh, smart meters were going to be Ember's killer app. When did, how, when did that become clear? Two years ago. So after seven years, the killer app emerges. The standard had been ready you know, yeah. evolving slowly, and then the killer app emerges as someone suddenly decided they wanted to put smart meters in homes and talk to the devices in the home. The next advantage for Ember, by the way, is now that the smart meters all have Zigbee, guess what? They need to talk to things in the home, mm -hmm. and there's a 10 to 100 times the number of those as there are smart meters. You're going to be a big company someday. Thanks. <laughs> Over here. I'm Kishore. I work in the search architecture team in uh, Monster. Um, uh, since I manage the search part of the search architecture, I'm thinking more in terms of the uh, data that you, that you guys were referring to, saying that the RFIDs and all these tags are going to generate this abundance of data. So where do you see the search, um, the, the search technology as it exists today? Is that going to evolve to the point where it's going to be impactful enough uh, in, in, in your arena or in your area? Who wants to take that? You, want to, you mean in searching, using search techniques to search through uh, Internet search. of Things data? Yeah, exactly, because there's a huge amount of data that's generated based, based upon what you were just referring so to. Saying. A similar question to the database question that came up earlier. How, do, how is this data going to be? What container is it going to be in, and how is it going to be indexed? And uh, I'm sure you have the answer to this question. <laughs> well, <laughs> <clears throat> well, I mean, I, what I'll add is, for example, um, recently I was talking to, not recently, but 10 years ago I was talking to a retailer, and he said, you need to understand my operations. Here's 300 hours of video. Search it, and you'll see something that you, RFID will be useful with. And I said, I'm not going to watch 300 hours of video. I'm going to have a grad student do it. So I had a grad student do it. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but imagine if, however, you had an RFID reader that watched every package go through, and you time indexed it. You time indexed the video. Suddenly now, I can create a video flow of you know, just snippets showing that package going through a door, entering a truck, you know, wherever there's video, right? So essentially now you can have all these really interesting meta data attached to video, to various other things that we don't really search anymore. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I think there's a whole dimension, dementia, <laughs> of searching <laughs> that's, going to, uh, that's going to evolve from this, which is meta level information attached to Otherwise, dumb rote information, you know? I don't think yeah. the plural of dimension is dimension. I would just add that, you know, today, I, uh, I haven't seen this application, but I'm told you can go into Harrods in London and you can buy meat 
and the meat has a label on it with a unique serial number, and you can type that into a website, and you can see the entire history of that meat, where the cow was raised, where it was killed. Pictures of it as a calf. A pi baby <laughs> pictures. Well, you know, I, <laughs> so, you know, to, to, for consumers to be able to say, I, I bought a bottle of wine. I want to know what temperature this wine was stored at from the time it was bottled until the time I just got it. And was there any time where it was out of the temperature range, in which case I don't want to buy it? There's a program in Maine where you can uh, put a tag on the lobster, and then on the table you can just click it and see the picture of the fisherman who caught it in his boat. <laughs> his Endless opportunity. It just goes on. I don't, I don't know if this answers the question, but one of the things, too, that, that we see is uh, kind of having an energy channel, right? This one guy tells a story, which is not so uncommon, of how his, uh, his father-in-law used to unplug his VCR every night because it was wasting energy with the blinking blue light. But meanwhile, he had a 20-year-old uh, freezer in the garage that was using more energy every night than his, his unplugging his VCR for a year. What's the point? The point is that if you don't know how you're using it, so you could have Pareto this, you could have an energy channel, which sounds you know, coming from someone who's got a lot of self-interest. But on the other hand, who would have thought we'd be watching a weather channel uh, 10 years ago, 20 years ago? So as you have this data, there's lots of ways you can, you can put in, and see how you track it. So I think, I think there are a lot of things you can do. But you know, the internet wasn't invented for Google. You need to have an infrastructure first, and then you'll have very creative people who find ways to make that useful and interesting to the users. And, and I think this concept mm -hmm. of Internet of Things as providing metadata on physical objects that travel with the objects, it, it, you know, it resonates with database-y type people, right? So that's quite interesting. <laughs> yes? Yes, uh, this refers to the RFID statements uh, during the conversation. I, by experience over the last three years, I've implemented a number of RFID projects. And I don't think that the cost on the RFID tag is so much an issue as the technology itself. I disagree that the technology is there. The technology is limited. You can only reach three meters uh, on average of reading the uh, range. And this has a lot of limitations. And if you, will, if you want to extend that range to 20 meters, you need an active tag. And therefore, the price goes from a few cents to $10. So there's, huh? Ice of, Ice of Stone, a Chinese outsourcing company, a global uh, outsourcing company from China. Um, uh, basically, the issue is uh, what is the next innovation on RFID tags? I mean, there, there's so, such a basic physical limits to RFID today. As you know, in a, in a project for, with Lufthansa, I wanted to track all their uh, maintenance of the aircraft. 2,000 parts per aircraft, and store all the data in a tag. That is possible, but it was the technology is not capable of. Um, you know, you put these tags on metal, they don't read. Okay. So I'll, can I answer that? Because you know, I, I've seen the history, and I and I've I've seen the technology evolve. So so five years ago, you 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 had you know, 10, 10 feet of read range uh, at the best of situations. Today, there are tags that are about that big, that wide, that can be read at, at 20, 30 meters, uh, depending on the situation. Meters or feet? Uh, meet, meters, wow. meters. There's a- uh, Passive, passive? Passive yep. tag. We had a passive tag unveiled at our event. We did a conference last uh, month. And uh, there's a big tag for assets that can be read at 130 feet. Right, passive tag. Now it's big and it's expensive, but it's meant to go on a big metal container. So, you know, so does the technology have limitations? Absolutely, every technology has limitations. My laptop cannot cook a steak. You know, it just can't. No, 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 no. <laughs> I mean, you, you know, there's lots of things. The, the question is, is there, are there applications where the technology makes a lot of sense uh, that barcodes don't work today? I mean, one of the things that, that drives me absolutely bonkers is people saying barcodes are cheaper than RFID. That's absolutely nuts. Right. Right. If that were the case, everybody would be taking inventory with barcodes. Right. You go, go into a store, I, they take inventory two times a year. That's nuts. I By agree. Way, I, don't, I don't look at the cost of RFID as uh, in itself, it's an incremental cost. You know, the cost of RFID minus the cost of the barcode because you, the people are using barcodes But what about today. the cost of the guy who has to scan the barcode? How much does he cost? No, no, it's RFID expensive. is so not let's, as, let's, is, let's have, we'll have time afterwards I, I, for RFID further discussion. RFID is not as expensive. So. Uh, it's not the reason why it's not deployed. It's physically limited. 
and I don't see that limitation being addressed anywhere. I mean, it's, it's being addressed. Uh, you know, I'll talk uh, to you after if you let, want. Let's I mean, move I'll, on. I'll Thank point you to tags, but but th there's tremendous innovation going on. There are tags that can now be read. 365. I, I, no, I, 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 let's talk about it uh, afterwards because right. I, I've, I've designed an antenna for an RFID with the Fraunhofer Institute in Germany for Lufthansa, mm -hmm. and there is physical limitations, no more than two meters. Mike, may I make a quick comment? Sure. Uh, you know, I respectfully but vehemently disagree with you, or with your disagreement with me, all right, or with others. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, Thanks for sticking out. <laughs> right. Here's the deal. Um, your cell phone doesn't pick up in elevators. You know it, you live with it, you deal with it, right? If you adopt a technology, you wrap yourself around it. Technologies have limitations, right? And the fact of the matter is, if you're trying to see it as some sort of magic replacement for something, because that's how you're thinking about it, you will always fail. Frankly, if a tag can be read from, by, from more than 10 meters, in fact, we've seen it, it's a big problem because you don't know where the hell the thing is, right? Um, in fact, you don't know if it's on this pallet or that right, pallet. Right. And in fact, we are actually having to tone, you know, power down the readers to figure out where it is. So uh, it's a long discussion. We can talk right. about it afterwards. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, my name is Xiao Yuni, and I'm part of the organizing committee. <coughs> and I'm from China, uh, Wuxi, China, a middle-sized city uh, near Shanghai. And uh, at that place, uh, the country is recently like starting to build up a re national research center focusing on the Internet of Things. And my question is, so would you please give any, uh, some advices on how to make it better? Second is, uh, how, how to... Uh, Oh, sorry, first, first, first question first. <laughs> well, I, I would just say, you know, take, take that speaker's comment and, and, you know, there are plenty of great applications for which the technology today is not yet suitable. So um, how can you, how can you, you know, what kind of research can you do that addresses some of those issues? And wh one of the things I mentioned earlier is one of the limitations in RFID is lack of domain expertise. So, so folks don't necessarily, folks who make tags and readers don't necessarily know the problems that an apparel retail company has or that an auto company or Lufthansa has. And so, you know, research needs to be done to say how do we overcome some of these limitations and unlock the value that RFID can can unlock, um, and, and I think there's there's an you know an infinite number of things you can do in that area. Yeah, I think the other thing too is a little bit what Sanjay said, which is you want to make sure you understand the basics of the technology to match up with the and the technology may have to evolve. But I'll give you a simple example, right? Some people think of wireless as just cutting the wires, and and th at one level that's fine, but on another level. Uh, when we were starting off doing some security systems, it's very easy with the wire to send a hel uh, uh, just a, a heartbeat every microsecond. No big deal. But when you're in RF, that's taking up bandwidth, and that's not the way you want to do it. And so if you think about this as architecting it around, I have wires, or I have this other solution, I have a barcode today, and I just want to replace it, you're probably going to be disappointed because you're setting everything you want on a different technology. So I would say merge the two and take advantage of the benefits, but recognize the limitations. I'm sure it was similar when you did packet switching, right? People who have, I'm sure people said, hey, you can't do tel telephony on it. They right? said that. That's right? Right. Can, and, can uh, <laughs> right? And then people said, you can't do video on it. Did they say that too? They said that too. But then they got faster and faster and faster, and those constraints went away. Because Not in phase people, one. people spent money right. to invest and to solve those problems, and I think we'll see the same thing. Right. And then Skype happened, right? right. <laughs> Thank okay. you. My Next second question, question is, uh, so what China or the uh, research center will play or should play in the industry? Oh. So. Well, there's, there's a lot of, China is a great place right now, right? There's a lot of investment. There's a lot of places where you get to start with a green sheet of paper or a white sheet of paper um, and not having this, in a sense, being burdened by an infrastructure that you have to tie into. And that takes away a lot of the complexity. So, uh, so I think the, there's a huge opportunity there in a variety of different areas. So, uh, so we're very optimistic. Now, the other thing is I think China is doing a good job, and I think they've always done this, but they're doing a very good job of 
communicating and working with places like the US on smart energy to learn from the experiences that are there. And I, so from our standpoint, it'd be keep doing the same, just do it faster. Because in this particular area that, that we see, um, we all, three of us said at least the US were doing a lot of things in terms of this Internet of Things. So I think that this is one of the few areas where in many, area, in many cases the US has a leadership position. And it doesn't mean it should be just copy and paste, but it does mean that there's a lot to be learned from some of these experiences. If I may make another comment, and I won't presume to speak for China because I've been there, but I'm not, I know very little about China, but I can tell you what I said in a talk I gave in India last year, which is that I, if Indian scientists don't have the guts to solve Indian problems, and they simply try and mimic something that's happening somewhere else because it looks glamorous, but you know, it could be something very mundane but local, if they don't have the guts to do that, they will never be world leaders. But if they're solving local problems, I know it doesn't look as glamorous, then, and I, I, I assume the same thing would have to apply to China, then you're innovating. Thank you very much. Okay. Let's take one more question. Yes. Thank you. Elisa Wojtaszek, I'm with uh, Doc IT. We are a facility-based data center providers. I have a question as far as acceptance of the Internet of Things in the data center environment, and not just for tracking assets such as blades and servers, but for active control. As, as you mentioned in Ember, where you can interact with the utility, how long do you think in this very conservative industry of data centers, um, control and uh, uh, Internet of Things will will be implemented to save energy and to, serve, to be more sustainable? Data center. It's, it's not a, a core area for us, but I've been involved in a few discussions there, and my sense is that it's going to happen sooner rather than later, not because of the innovation, innovativeness or receptivity to change there. It's because there's a, there's a bit of a crisis of sorts going on in the data center, that uh, when, when people plan a data center, uh, energy and environmental controls become more important than the computing capacity and the storage capacity of the data center. And so that being the case, you have to address it. So I, I do think that it's a huge problem and there are a lot of people addressing it in various ways. So, so I feel pretty good that that's going to happen sooner than later from the discussions that I've had. Now, a little bit, some of that could be, as Bob said, the early hype, but uh, but I think the, the problems are so large that, that they're going to address it uh, relatively quickly. But every major computer company has a green initiative which is aimed at data center energy efficiency. And then I've run into 10 startups, all of whom are not just startups anymore. They now have revenue. They're instrumenting racks and uh, controlling temperature. And we've profiled so it's happening a now. Yeah, we've profiled a number of these in our research, too. And you can actually tell which disk drive, which spindle spun up based on the power signature of it spinning up when it goes. So this technology is coming. Right. What and about the control part? You see that, that sort of a passive um, monitoring is one thing, but the active control is another thing. It's a huge, huge uh, uh, barrier to overcome in data centers. I mean, it's a smaller barrier in home because, yep. well, if my refrigerator you know, is shut down by the control, well, I don't care. I mean, I, I do care. No, that, but that part, but, you're absolutely right. If you right. look at the Internet of Things, um, the non-mission critical application, so it, that's, we were involved in some industrial process control, and it was absolutely clear that those guys are going to watch things like homes and then commercial buildings run for years before they allow their process control to be uh, controlled. Even monitored for those guys was a big deal. So, so you could be right. I'm just saying from the, the rhetoric we hear, the dialogue we hear, uh, they talk about needing to do that. And they're, they're very much coming close to a crisis of sorts if they don't do it. So um, there's no doubt it's not going to be done with, with great... Uh, with great fanfare and excitement, but it's going to be a necessary thing to do very quickly. As well, speaking of rhetoric, I think it was a New Yorker this week on our interview of Saul Griffith, and he had a factoid. The carbon footprint of the internet is now bigger than the carbon fin footprint of the airline industry. So it's a, it may not be true. <laughs> but it, <laughs> And then you, and then, and even if it is true, you could ask, so what? And you know, what's in the numerator? What's the denominator? But to your point, I, I think that it's it's now adopted that we're going to have to solve the data center 
energy problem one way or the other. I believe the secret is not to generate the heat to begin with, um, rather than cool the hell out of it. But. If I may, just a quick comment. Uh, the actuator question there, um, you know, job security rule number 17, as you probably know, <laughs> is to say that surely we can't control something on using wireless. You know, I mean, it's not robust. We need wires. We need, remember MapTop before they adopted the, the manufacturing auto automation protocol before they adopted Ethernet, right? Uh, so one of the things that uh, I hear a lot is you can't control things using wireless. It's just not robust enough, right? And so that is uh, a feeling that will have to be uh, addressed. Partly it's valid. I and mean, there's some security issues and connectivity issues, but you know that's the way it's going to go, but that's what people say. But I, I also think you don't necessarily need to have the wireless device to do the controlling. So if the wireless device is feeding information to your network management system, and the network management system could go back and say to, to the sensor, you know, what else, you know, what else is going on, and, and then make an intelligent decision about how to shut down the device or, or power down the, whatever needs to be done.